Dr. Davis and I have no financial disclosures to report. We jump right into our case, which is of a 55-year-old woman with a prior history of glaucoma who presented to my clinic with intermittent blurred vision of both eyes for several years. On review of systems, she denied having any redness, associated headaches with her vision changes, and she also denied having any correlation with changes in lighting. She did endorse dry eye sensation and vision that improved with blinking. Notably, she was not using any artificial tears. Upon further review, she again reiterated that she had been diagnosed in Cuba with glaucoma, which was a diagnosis that her mother also carried. She had a history of migraine headaches and ITP, which wasn't really a huge health concern for her. She was using Timolol drops in both eyes twice a day, and her social history was significant for the fact that she was from Cuba. Her exam, besides for a central corneal thickness that was thinner than normal, was relatively bland. She was noted to have a physiologic anisocoria, and her gonioscopy, while she had narrow angles, they were open. So this was her posterior exam, and there is some asymmetry between the right and left discs, but you can see that there are no retinal findings or lesions. So at that time, my assessment and plan was to call her a glaucoma suspect until I determined otherwise that she had true glaucomatous defects. My plan was to continue her drops and to get baseline disc photos, RNFL, and visual fields, and have her come back in six months to repeat testing, unless those fields or RNFL showed uh, concerning findings. So this was her baseline testing, and the RNFL corroborated those findings on the physical exam that the right nerve was indeed a little bit more cupped than the left side, and there was some thinning. The visual field, while it wasn't the best reliability, did not seem to have any glaringly obvious glaucomatous defects. So instead of being able to make it six months, she ended up coming one month earlier to the emergency room, at which time she complained of decreased vision and pain of the right eye for about seven days. She denied any changes in her medical history. Her visual acuity at that time was 20-20 in the affected eye, 20-30 in the left, and her IOP was elevated at 40. She again had physiologic anisocoria, but no APD. On exam, she was noted to have a white and quiet conge. Her cornea had concrete epithelial erosions, and her AC was shallow. Her gonio showed that there were no structures visible except in one quadrant superiorly. The fundus exam was documented as being limited secondary to meiosis. So based on the, the grand rounds and the purpose of my talk, I divided my differential into two separate categories. Than without. So here things to consider would be uh, entities such as acute angle closure, uh, supracarotid hemorrhages, carotid cavernous fistulas, just to name a few. So the assessment and plan at that time was to call this a presumed acute on chronic angle closure given the elevated IOP and the lack of angle structures visualized. She received one drop of or one round of drops in the ER and she received a laser peripheral iridotomy and was given Predforte QID for one week for post-op care. At disposition, at, at discharge, her IOP was 25 in the affected eye, and she was scheduled to come and see me in one week for the post-op check as well as consideration for a PI in the left eye. I'm just going to take a quick little tangent here and discuss the value of PIs. Few people have looked at this, and at least in this one study by Choi, they looked at 54 primary angle closure glaucoma patients, and they showed that one-third of patients, despite getting a uh, PI, had PAS progression. That said, on the optimistic side, two-thirds did not have progression, so one might argue that it is valuable. In a Cochrane database review done this year, they looked at 2,500 eyes, and they deemed that there was not enough evidence to assess the true efficacy of iridotomy on slowing visual field loss or other metrics. The cost of PIs are also not very cheap. The estimated national average, according to some random internet site was around $2,000, which is not necessarily um, chump change for our patient population. And one study did look at the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of early lens extraction for primary angle closure glaucoma, and they thought, you know, it should be considered for first line treatment in this case. So back to our patient. When she came back to see me at post-op week one, she was continuing to complain of persistent mild discomfort of the right eye. She said that her vision continued to get worse, and her vision indeed was 2040 in the affected eye with an IOP of 29. She was still taking her glaucoma medications and had finished her PRED drops 
So just the way our clinic works, she ended up getting imaging that I had ordered for her six-month visit, but she got it a little bit earlier before she saw me. And initially when I looked at it, I thought, wow, her RNFL has improved. And then upon closer investigation, I noticed that she was actually edematous in that right eye. So not having seen the patient and having these data points, I thought, did she have an NAION secondary to acute angle closure? And this has been reported by Dr. Lim here, in fact, and I actually ran this up to Dr. Lim just to see his thoughts and what he, uh, what he was thinking. Um, the main difference here is that you can see in the photos that this woman has a disc at risk relative to our lady who did have a larger cup to disc. Um, typical to this finding is a secocentral defect. So finally the patient came back to me and I had one of our excellent fellows, uh, Dr. Chirpak, come and just take a look because I wanted her to confirm my gonioscopy exam. When we sat her down finally, we saw that she had plus one injection diffusely and she did have new granulomatous keratic precipitates. She did notably have a peripheral aerodotomy that was transilluminating in the right eye. Of note, she did not have any iris bombay. So going back to our differential with the elevated IOP, now we have inflammation, and so we have to consider infectious etiologies and other inflammatory issues. One thought I did have, though, was if this inflammation could be attributed to the PI that she had recently had. And it's not completely unusual. There are cases of chronic uveitis being reported after doing a peripheral iridotomy with YAG. And there are in cases in which patients with dark irides were reported to have greater inflammation than those who did not. But something very important is missing here. Here it's me, but <laughs> it's the fundus exam. So since her presentation to the emergency room, she did not have a single documented fun fundus exam. So if one of my colleagues can briefly describe for me what they see here. Uh, Michelle? We have fundus photos of the right and left eye. Um, view into the right eye is a little bit hazy, maybe a little bit of vitritis. Um, some cupping of the optic nerve. Um, overall, the vessels look normal. Attention is drawn to the macula where you see um, a whitish lesion in the inferior mac macula, sort of a headlight in the fog appearance. Um, and left eye, other than the optic nerve, cupping appears relatively unremarkable. Great, thank you. So now we shift gears to a differential diagnosis for white lesion in the retina. And here we think a lot of infectious etiologies and other infiltrative processes. And given her clinical presentation, um, well, sorry. She, so she did end up getting some more imaging just really for documentation purposes. Um, if you want to describe here, Michelle. Sure. Um, so in the right eye, OCT of the right eye, we see some um, subretinal fluid. Um, and some uh, disruption of the outer um, layers. And uh, left eye looks relatively unremarkable. Excellent, great. And you do see all the debris there from the vitritis. And her FA was as follows. Um, so FA of the right eye, we see um, early hypoautofluorescence um, hypo with um, late um, staining of the borders of the, uh, where the lesion is. So the diagnosis? Toxoplasmosis. Yes. So this is toxoplasmosis. And so just for discussion's sake, we're just going to go very briefly over primary toxoplasmosis. Since our patient didn't have a corioretinal scar, though it's really hard to say whether she has primary or secondary. Um, we'll talk about diagnosis and ancillary testing, the management and the prognosis of this condition. So primary toxoplasmosis, importantly in an immunocompetent patient, 90% are asymptomatic when they're first affected. 10% are symptomatic with systemic issues, including lymphadenopathy, fevers, chills, myalgias, etc. When they are affected in the eye uh, with chorioretinitis, they can have floaters, blurry vision, pain, and redness. Interestingly enough, there are different serology or serotypes of toxoplasmosis, and in our Latin American population, those serotypes tend to be more symptomatic with primary infection than in Europe, for example. Ocular findings, uh, they were quite classic in our situation here with our patient, but they can vary and you can get things like stellate keratic precipitates as well as granulomatous lesions like for our patient. And then of course the white focal retinitis, which is quite classic clinically. In terms of the diagnosis, it is pretty clinical. This is something here that we learn relatively early to diagnose given the clinical presentation. Ancillary testing may or may not always be helpful. 
For example, serologies, while they might be present in someone who is immunocompetent, in someone who is immunocompromised, they may not have those IgGs or IgMs present. That said, in someone who is immunocompetent, the lack of these, um, these immunoglobulins does help rule out this entity. Our OCT was quite classic for this, and as you see here, you do get subretinal fluid and loss of inner and outer structures. The ICG shows hypofluorescence of active and inactive lesions, and the FA shows an early hypofluorescence with a late intense hyperfluorescence of the, of the lesion margins. You can get a papillitis, and you can get hyperfluorescence of the optic nerve head. Treatment of macular and papillary toxoplasmosis may be considered a little bit different than peripheral lesions, which may or may not be treated depending on the severity. Here is just a list of systemic therapies that we often use. Here at Baskin Palmer, when someone comes in with a macular lesion, we tend to reach for the clindamycin and the Bactrim, and we do dual therapy. There are intravitreal options as well, too, for those who cannot tolerate systemic therapies, and several groups have shown that there is no difference in efficacy with classic treatment. Here's another study also looking at clindamycin with dexamethasone, and they demonstrated similar findings. Here, Dr. Flynn and Dr. Albini were co-authors in an investigation of four cases looking at intravitreal Bactrim, and they also noted that there was no inferiority compared to classic treatments. So when should we consider injection? We should consider it when we can't use systemic therapies in cases such as pregnancy, uh, failure of conventional therapy, side effects to oral medications, people who might be of poor compliance, or when it is cost restrictive. The prognosis of ocular toxoplasmosis is not that bad, although 79% of patients who were affected were noted to have a recurrence in the same eye within five years, or when they were followed for greater than five years. The main risk factors for having permanent visual loss or significant visual loss was congenital infection, ocular toxoplasma uh, manifesting during acute systemic infection, central location, and steroid use without the use of concurrent antiparasitics. The rate of recurrence can be reduced, however, with just using Bactrim every other day. And this study looked at using prophylactic therapy for one year and showed that 12% of patients who did not have it did recur, whereas 0% who were taking the prophylactic medication did not. So back to our patient, she came back to me again with more labs, and she was noted to be positive for toxoplasma IgG. So with the IgM negative, hard to say if this was truly a primary toxoplasma infection. She was started at that time um, with dual therapy and double strength Bactrim and clindamycin, as well as some topical medications. And two days later when she returned, she was started on PO prednisone. One month later, she returned to my clinic, and her vision was beginning to stabilize. Her right eye was now 20-30 with an IOP of 21. She denied having any more pain, and she said that the floaters were minimal. She was off her oral steroids, and she was currently in the process of uh, tapering down her topicals. She was still taking her Combigan and Bromonidine. So the take-home points of my talk today is that we should always dilate as soon as able. It's unclear at what point she started manifesting these retinal changes but um, very important to as soon as able after the PI. Um, and then of course, always to consider intravitreal injections for patients who might not be able to take systemic therapies.